Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a talk on everything you've wanted to know and need to know about antifungals for board-related purposes. Now, if you talk to two infectious disease doctors, you're going to get three different opinions. So this is by no means a substitute for referring your patients to ID. The information I'm going to give you is certainly relevant clinically, uh, but I don't want you to think after you watch this that uh, you're a substitute for an infectious disease doctor because the, you know, with, with infectious diseases, resistance is always developing and emerging and new strains and all that stuff. And so the science of this is really fluid. But for board purposes, this is the stuff you need to know. And I pour over thousands of questions before I make these videos, folks. And so I write down the right answers and make sure that I sort of know wh where these board questions are going so that the information I give you is relevant for particularly USMLE. So this, this is the information that I'm giving you, but make sure and always consult your infectious disease doctor um, if you uh, feel you may be getting out of your comfort zone. All right. Uh, just a plug for my Patreon. If you haven't yet, please consider subscribing. A dollar a month really goes a long way uh, to help offset the cost of these videos. You can get there by clicking the link on the upper right hand corner up here or down below in the description of the video. And uh, I very much appreciate your consideration. All right, so this is just an overview of what we're going to talk about. We're going to just briefly go over the basics of the fungal cell uh, because it'll uh, set us up to talk about uh, these various classes of antifungals, which often get overlooked by students and residents studying for their exams. So uh, examiners like to go after it because they know uh, that these often get neglected. Um, so this is why I'm making the video. Okay. So the fungal cell wall is, and by the way, fung fungi have cell walls. Uh, so they have cell walls and cell membranes. The fungal cell wall is made up of mannaproteins, beta-glucan, and chitin. Now, beta-glucan is a really important one because that's the target uh, indirectly of one of the drug classes, a very important and new drug class uh, of antifungals. Now, we all have cholesterol in our cell membranes. Remember, cholesterol gives our membranes some fluidity, so they're not rigid. Now, fungi have something similar, but it's called ergosterol. So ergosterol is not found in our cell membranes. So as I'm sure you can imagine, that's a very attractive thing to go after uh, because you can target something that's not in our cells, so it's going to minimize adverse effects. And indeed, there are three ways that we go after ergosterol, either directly or indirectly in the synthesis process. Okay, so inhibitors of ergosterol synthesis. We start with squalene and there are multiple steps and we end with ergosterol. So these two drugs are terbinafine and the azole family of antifungals. So terbinafine inhibits the first step. Squalene to squalene epoxide, that enzyme is called squalene epoxidase. If you're taking step one, you got to know that. And then the azole antifungals go after the last step, uh, which is lanosterol demethylase, and that's lanosterol to ergosterol. Terbinafine is a very useful antifungal for the treatment of tinea infections. So what are tinea infections? They're tinea cruris or jock itch tinea pedis or athlete's foot, tinea corporis, uh, ringworm. So these are things you see very frequently in the, uh, in, in the outpatient clinic. So terbinafine is a good one to have in your back pocket. Uh, you'll use it a lot. It's a great drug. Uh, onychomycosis, another thing that we use terbinafine for. Uh, this is also a tinea infection. It's called tinea unguinum or something. I'm not, I'm not spelling that right. But uh, anyway, they'll probably be told onychomycosis on the exam. So that's a fungal infection. It causes discoloration of the nails. The primary adverse effects for terbinafine is hepatotoxicity. Now, you don't, for the most part, for most patients, you don't need to worry about that. But let's say you've got a patient who has a history of alcoholism or maybe is an active alcoholic. Uh, you may want to get liver function tests just to be safe. 
It can also cause an exacerbation of autoimmune diseases, pretty low yield for your examination, but lupus flares can happen if you do have a patient with lupus that you're putting on terbinafine. Now the azole antifungals so inhibit that last step, lanosterol dimethylase, and it has a wide spectrum of use. There are many azole antifungals. So let's just go through some of these. Clotrimazole is one, very commonly used for vulvovaginal candidiasis, colloquially, colloquially known as a yeast infection. So curdy white discharge, vaginal itching in a woman, very typical. Ketoconazole, not used so much anymore. We'll go into why that is. Voriconazole, please note this one. I'm going to put a little exclamation point right here because it is possible. I have seen test questions that give you a patient with invasive aspergillosis and they want to know which azole antifungal you use. And in fact, voriconazole is the superior azole drug for treating invasive aspergillosis. So know that one. Fluconazole can be used for the long-term treatment of mild cryptococcal meningitis, as well as one of those three big dimorphic fungi, uh, and that one is coccidioidomycosis. So you've got a patient that develops joint pains and cough, and uh, maybe they've got uh, paniculitis uh, in, uh, on their legs. Uh, that is a picture of coccidioidomycosis. You get fluconazole. Uh, so that's also known as desert fever. Uh, itraconazole is used for blastomycosis and histoplasmosis. Remember, histoplasmosis, they like to, uh, when they test that one, they'll tell you you've got uh, someone was uh, exploring caves or something like that. And then itraconazole is also used for a particular uh, form of aspergillosis called allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, which is uh, prevalent in patients with cystic fibrosis. Okay, uh, so the adverse effects for the azole antifungals, the big one is that in it inhibits the P450 enzymes. Um, so that you need to take under advisory because if the patient is on certain other medications, it could increase the levels of those medications, in particular Coumadin. Okay, um, now ketoconazole is of note because it has the effect of inhibiting steroid synthesis. Uh, so it can cause hypoadrenalism by reducing uh, cortisol, and it can cause gynecomastia by inhibiting the production of androgens. So that may be thrown at you as well. Now we'll move on to the echinocandins. These inhibit beta-glucan synthesis. Remember, beta-glucan is part of the cell wall of fungus. Up to now, we've been talking about our gosterol, which is part of the cell membrane. This is part of the cell wall. The echinocandins all end in fungin. Okay, so we got caspofungin, mycofungin, and anidula fungin. So right here, this is where we're affecting uh, the process. Uh, so these are your echinocandins. And I like to just say the fungins because they all end in fungin. All right, so... Uh, these beta-glucans, you can think of them as sort of the fungal equivalent of peptidoglycan in bacteria in that they're constituent of the cell wall. And by inhibiting their production or inhibiting their cross-linking or however you're going after it, you're affecting the cell wall. Uh, so uh, you can think of this as like the penicillin of fungus. Although penicillin came from a fungus, so that makes things a little complicated, huh? Okay, so echinocandins are wonderful drugs for candidemia. So you've got invasive candidiasis in an immunocompromised patient. Instead of going for, am for amphotericin B, which has a nasty side effect profile, you can go for one of these echinocandins. And that's really nice because the echinocandins are pretty well tolerated. So you use this for severe systemic candidal infections, and in particular for HIV fungal esophagitis. So you've got a patient with HIV that has esophagitis, and you know it's a fungal cause and not from CMV or something like that. Then you will go for an echinocandid. Now, you cannot give 
nice statin swish and swallow like you would for other people. When the patient has HIV fungal esophagitis, you must use systemic drugs. So you have to use systemic drugs for HIV fungal esophagitis, and the echinocandin is what you're going to go for. Now we'll talk about the ergosterol binders. These are nystatin and amphotericin B. So these drugs bind ergosterol. And by doing so, they poke holes in the cell membrane. And that kills the fungus. So we have nystatin and amphotericin B. They work the same way. Nystatin is topical only. And it's, you know, it doesn't really have a whole lot of side effects. However, it's really used for some of the more benign candidal uh, infection. So mucocutaneous candidiasis, like a yeast infection, could be used in suppository form there. Uh, it can, they, there's a powder for it. Um, and it can also be used for oropharyngeal candidiasis, like thrush. So you got a patient who's got asthma, they're on an inhaler, they don't space it properly, they wind up with uh, white patches uh, on in their mouth, which can be scraped off. That's thrush. You'd use nystatin swish and spit for that. Now, do not use, do not use nystatin for tinea infections. In particular, don't use it for, for jock itch, for tinea curis. Okay, so for tinea, you should best go for terbinafine. Unless it's tinea capitis, which we'll get to uh, in a, few, uh, a later slide. The big side effect for nystatin is Stevens-Johnson syndrome. It, so you've got a patient on nystatin. They show up days later with a rash, uh, blistering, uh, you know, sort of a desquamating rash. Uh, you've got to take them off of it. Amphotericin B is, uh, works the same way, but it's systemic. Uh, and so amphotericin B, if you've got a patient with a severe fungal infection, uh, they're immunocompromised or whatever, amphotericin B is probably going to be the right answer. Unless you've got a patient with severe systemic candidemia, then you should probably go for one of those echinocandins. Amphotericin B plays a big role in the treatment of cryptococcal meningitis. Cryptococcal meningitis. Uh, right? So that's the, those patients with uh, soap bubble lesions in the gray matter who have a history of HIV, maybe focal neurologic signs, and so forth. Adverse effects. A lot. They don't call it amphoterrible for nothing. The big one is fever and rigors. So this is also known as shake and bake. And you can actually treat this with Demerol and Tylenol. So I've actually watched that be done twice, um, but I wasn't administering it. It was an infectious disease doctor uh, because obviously these patients had really severe fungal illnesses. So uh, you can abort uh, these side effects. Uh, then there are a couple other ones which we're not going to go into. Uh, you should, very important, give amphotericin B with ample fluids. And there is a liposomal formulation for amphotericin B, which is less toxic. However, it's more expensive, and it's supposedly, a lot of people think, not as effective. All right, now we're going to talk about one more, and that's griseofulvin. Now, griseofulvin is like chemotherapy for fungal cells. So it blocks microtubules, and in doing so, blocks mitosis and uh, proliferation of fungi. Now, griseofulvin has a very unique capability in that it binds keratin. Now, where do you have keratin? Your skin and your hair. So it's really good for tinea capitis. And something you need to know about tinea capitis, unlike the other tinias, tinea capitis has to be treated systemically. So no topical treatment. You've got to give a pill for tinea capitis. Um, now, tinea capitis often shows up kind of like alopecia areata, where they're losing, uh, they're, they're losing uh, patches of hair. Um, and so uh, you've probably seen this before. So tinea capitis is the big one uh, for griseofulvin. Also, tinea versicolor, it's the treatment of choice. Remember, that's caused by malassezia furfur. And that causes uh, alternating pigmented and uh, depigmented patches on the skin. 
The adverse effects are primarily GI disturbances and photosensitivity, nothing you're going to get asked about on boards. So these are all our drugs. Uh, we've talked about terbinafine, amphotericin B, nystatin, echinocannins, azoles, griseofulvin, and then there's one more. It's called flucytosine. It is a component of treatment for cryptococcal meningitis, and flucytosine gets converted to 5-fluorouracil, and as I'm sure you can imagine, that is uh, toxic to the proliferation of cells because it affects DNA and RNA synthesis. So it's, it's like another chemotherapy drug for, it's an anti-metabolite for fungi. Uh, one more that I want to point out is selenium sulfide. It's given for tinea versicolor and tinea capitis, can be bought over the counter. All right, so this is your cheat sheet here. So the candidiases for oropharyngeal candidiasis, typically treated over the counter, um, or, sorry, uh, mucocutaneous candidiasis, typically treated over the counter, uh, but you use clotrimazole or myconazole, and that's usually given vaginal suppositories and creams and stuff. Oropharyngeal candidiasis, like thrush, nystatin, oral sus suspension. HIV fungal esophagitis, remember that needs to be treated systemically, and you would use echinocandins. Invasive candidiasis, echinocandins. So bad candidemias, use echinocandins, not amphotericin B. Tinea capitis, you must treat systemically, and so you'll go for either terbinafine or for griseofulvin, but you've got to use systemic antifungals. For the other tinias, it's terbinafine, and that you can either use, uh, you can use the terbinafine or you can use uh, uh, other uh, topical agents. Tinea cruris, you can use uh, clotrimazole uh, cream, but uh, really for these tinias, go for terbinafine, but for tinea capitis, know that you have to use systemic antifungals. Aspergillosis, remember, uh, and that's invasive aspergillosis, you need to use voriconazole. For blasto and histo, you should use itra, and for coccidioido, you should use flu. Uh, but in either case, if they're severe, go for, go for amphotericin B. For cryptococcal meningitis, it's amphotericin B and flucytosine, followed by fluconazole. For mucormycosis, remember that's that really nasty black eschar you get in sort of the nasal, uh, nasopharyngeal area in a patient, notably with a history of DKA. Uh, that needs to be treated with, of course, amphotericin B, because it's a really bad fungal infection, but also surgical debridement. And then finally, pneumocystis gyrovecchi. These are patients with HIV with a CD4 count under 200. Uh, this is, in fact, a fungus. Once upon a time, they used to think it was a protozoa, but it is unique in that we don't use an antifungal for it. We use Bactrim, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. So if you memorize this cheat sheet, you will be good to go for boards. And that's all I've got for you. I'll see you next time.